Hi, I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. I've had the privilege of talking with so many interesting folks over the years. I've been doing this show for now, wow, I'm going to say close to 10 years, and I've chatted with doctors and artists, tribal members and musicians, nonprofit leaders, and priests. I always learn stuff and have fun doing it. Today's guest is a young man who's been traveling the country for 457 days. Well, that was on his website yesterday, so it may be more at this point. (laughs) He is walking it for mental health awareness and recovery, and his name is Kendall Ray Edwards. Welcome to the show, Kendall. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I appreciate that, Candace. It's great having you here. And joining us for this chat is my dear friend and Brookings Core Response Executive Director, Diana Cooper. Always good to see your face. Always good to see yours. It seems like I see your face in the strangest circumstances, mm-hmm. too. I mean... Uh, when you're locked out of your car. When I'm know? locked out of my car, yes, with the motor running, <laughs> and my husband's in the doctor's office getting blood drawn, and I have to be here for this interview. I thought you were going to call me and tell me we weren't going to have it. I was going to be so mad. I know, no, 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 I know. I I clearly was willing to go through whatever had to happen in order to get this thing to happen, right? So, (laughs) yeah. It's been an interesting day so far, and the day is, yeah, four four hours old. So, (laughs) wow. So, Kindle, mental health and recovery is a big topic. Can you tell us about who you are, how you got started on this journey? What's with Kendall? Well, hi. Uh, my name is Kendall Ray Edwards, Coach Kendall Ray. I am a recovery coach now, um, a.k.a. a walking testimony. That's the name I go by as my journey with Walking America for mental health awareness and recovery. So, um Well, a little bit about me. I was born and raised um, right on the outskirts of Jacksonville, Florida. It's basically a metropolitan area. I'm from Orange Park, Florida, Clay County, born and raised my whole life. I am 30 years old, born March 30th, 1993, but I'm not going to give out my social security number. He's definitely a fellow Aries. But I was just going to say he's an Aries. Yes. Ram. I'm a Taurus. Myself. So I'm I'm right with you. Awesome. (laughs) Heck yeah. (laughs) That's super awesome. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you have a slight accent, but not, I I was expecting Florida is kind of south, right? But It know. is. And you know what? There is parts of Florida where the southern draw is a lot more stronger. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I'm just a city boy. Ah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so what was it? What was it like growing up? Was it, was it, Fun and cool or difficult and challenging? So, um, even though, and which we'll talk about in a little bit, I went down a bad path. Um, I wasn't raised in a bad household or anything like that. Um, you know, my uh, mom and dad, they're still married and together. I think like 35, 36 years now. Good grief. Um, <laughs> you know, I was born and raised in a Christian household. I was in the church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, oh. and anything in between. Right. Um I even went to private school for the first few years of my life. I didn't go to public school until fifth grade. Um, I even did some homeschooling and stuff like that. So I didn't grow up in a bad household. That led to me doing all the stuff I did. That kind of came with just getting the freedom as I was older because I was a very sheltered kid growing up. Um, And to anybody that has grown up in a bad household, I'm sorry that you've ever had to experience that. Everybody should be able to grow up with the love and care that we all deserve. So if you have experience growing up in a bad household, I am sorry that you have experienced that. Um, Just know that you're loved and cared about and that you matter. So um, growing up in the church and everything like that, um, I used to, I learned how to play guitar and the piano in the church. I used to lead a church praise band. I used to uh, write praise songs that we literally would uh, play in the church. Um, And it was actually a guy that was in the praise band with me. He was like my best friend. He used to come over to my house for weeks at the t- uh, at a time during the summer, like all the time we were hanging out. And uh, he's the first person that I ever ended up getting high with. Um, of course. After a little bit, uh, he ended up getting in a gang, and then I wanted to try to join the gang because I fell in love with the lifestyle. So it wasn't me just like 
hanging out and doing drugs with friends. Like I was more on the, I like to do wild stuff. So whenever I saw them doing all this stuff, like I'm like, it's crazy. That's not me, but I want to be a part of that. So I tried to join a gang and did all this crazy stuff. And it was um, to prove myself to join the gang. So it got down to, I was supposed to get jumped in by so many people on a Friday um, to actually be a part of the gang to officially be in. And it was a Wednesday night that I ended up going to church with my mom and um, because I was always in the church. And that night I was supposed to go with them. But I mean, I was underage still at the time. So, you know, I had to do my family thing. So I was at church and I was supposed to be a driver for them. But since I was at church, they all went to prison for armed robbery of a liquor store that night. And I was supposed to go. So um, that showed me right there that I wasn't actually supposed to be in a gang, but I still loved the lifestyle. I always hung out with gang bangers. Um, always thought I was a thug. Always had my pants below my waist with a bandana <laughs> hanging out of my pocket. And that bandana didn't even mean anything because I wasn't even part of a gang. I just loved it. I thought I was that. I thought I was that. way cooler yes. than I than <laughs> I was. Um, oh God, we also want to be cool, don't we? Oh, it was, we ju- it's like it's like the motivating force when you're in your teens. You just want to be cool. Well, I, I was never cool. You were never cool. Okay. <laughs> I have I, never been I cool. wanted to be cool. I was not one of the cool ones, but I wanted to be. I just, we have a lot more in common than I thought because I also grew up in the church, although my family didn't really go to church, but I started going independently. Play guitar, play piano, all that stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. So awesome. So, and That's I do write music. Funny. Oh, yeah. yeah. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome. So, I love you that. managed to evade the, the, getting busted for armed robbery which is great right i mean that's that's great did did but if you if you were still entranced with the lifestyle you probably were gonna get into trouble a lot a lot of trouble <laughs> um and i don't mean to say that like laughing or anything no, i'm not proud I got of it, it but i, I am got it. um and I do want to backtrack a little bit before mm-hmm. all the trouble. So part of my life, um, so whenever I tell people what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, it's because the last 16 years of my life, I've dealt with depression, addiction, and a life of crime. Um, and part of my, and I'm going to talk about the depression mm-hmm. part for a second. Um, so part of my depression came from, I was sexually abused in the church at a very young age. I'm um, so and sorry. you know what? It wasn't even addressed like for years um, and I didn't even realize the severity of it until years later but there was that and then at church we actually had a little Debbie vendor who um, had all these boxes of little Debbies that were taken off the shelf Um, but they were still good but it was just expiration date for shelf life Um, so I would get all these boxes of little Debbies handed to me so I gained so much weight at such a young age that I was like 12 years old wearing like size 36 men's pants, 198 pounds. It was bad. Um, And I just had no self-esteem. I was just depressed with life and everything like that. Um, So with the addiction, my addiction started way before I ever knew what drugs were, and that was lying and stealing. And I don't know if that stemmed from like, I really never even thought about this, but I don't know if that stemmed from the shame of the depression and everything I went to um, Mm -hmm. and just wanted to take my mind away from it. It really could have been. Um, I probably should think about that more. But it's uh, it led to, I was uh, 14 my freshman year of high school, which I used to um, you know, walk home from school every day. I actually got hit by a car walking home from school one day, got nailed. Um, oh, my God. And it was crazy because like we called 911 and everything, and it was like an hour and a half later that they sent a public service aide to check on me. <laughs> Gosh, that sounds like her. <laughs> it was bad. Wow. But literally my handprints were embedded in the hood of the car. Wow. Like they actually lived in the same apartment complex as me. Um, so every day that I would walk home from school after that, like I would see this car handprinted. But it was um, my freshman year of high school that one day um, I, I had saved up my lunch money and stuff and bought a gun from somebody, walked home. We were living in these apartments. Um, our apartment complex, they had like this line of garages on the other side with a fence behind it with through the woods. So I had went back there. And um, I just didn't want to be there anymore. Uh, more, and I just kind of dealt with myself um, for a while to amp myself up. And then I pointed this gun at myself and tried to pull the trigger, and it didn't fire. And then, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out what was wrong, turn it around, and then shot again, and it fired. 
So um, that right there showed me that I was supposed to be here for a reason. I've dealt with depression since then a little bit. I'm um, in 2017 over a girl and just a bunch of stuff that felt like it wasn't going right. You know, I popped a whole bunch of uh, cough medicine. Actually, that was my biggest addiction when it came to drugs really? was cough medicine and K2, synthetic marijuana that they used to sell out of the gas stations. Mm -hmm. um, but I had... Uh, in 2017, I popped like 11 boxes um, of them. I took 172 pills out of 176, um, like, and woke up the next morning completely sober, and it was just a really crazy experience. Because <laughs> yeah. I used to take like four boxes a day and then wake up high the next day. So to take 11 boxes and to wake up sober when I thought I shouldn't have woke up was just like, whoa, how did that happen? Um, but either way, so that's just a little bit of, um, you know, some of that stuff that leads up to why I'm walking. So back to, um, sorry. No, it's perfectly okay. Sorry. So all, all really interesting tales are convoluted. Yeah. They just are. They yep. just, they just are like that. <laughs> There's just so much to no, it, there you is know? So much. Um, can I, can I ask you about your depression? Because that, that's something that I think most teenagers deal with at at one point or another. I mean, if we're if we're lucky, it's um, not bad. It's not debilitating, and and we kind of get on with life once the hormones just kind of settle their butts out. But some of us, when when that trigger happens in our adolescence. It's it's literally the gateway into uh, a much more serious problem in terms of depression and mental health. So, did you ever get any medication for it? Was it a? Did you just hope that it would pass? I mean, how did that? Did it pass? Are you still battling depression? No, I don't battle depression anymore. Um, okay. I, I look at it like this. Even though sometimes I, I mention the words bad days, I try to say that I don't have any bad days. If I can smile just once throughout a day, um, even on my worst day, which feels like, I, it's not a bad day. It's just a bunch of bad moments throughout a good day. Um, it's a great perspective. Because every day that I get to wake up on this side of the dirt, it's a blessing because not everybody got to wake mm -hmm. up today. Um, right. And I'm so thankful for that because how many families are out there suffering this morning because yep. of the phone call that they got. Um, so, uh, but with my depression and dealing with it, um, you know, I think some people knew because at one point, like I used to wear black a little bit and like, at church functions and stuff, sometimes I was the life of the party or sometimes I would just sit in the corner and just like not want to talk to anybody, just want to be out of everybody's way. I was really weird. Um, so uh, That's not weird, by the way. That's <laughs> normal. I mean, it, it is normal adolescent behavior, especially if if there is a depression. You know, that's normal. And And it's weird. And I think some of it was... Well, of course, some of it went through some of the stuff I went through, but I think some of that depression was self brought on to the point like I had friends and stuff at church. I had people that I could hang out with. But if one day somebody didn't want to do what I wanted to do, I might just be dramatic about it. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, that might just affect me in a whole other way. This is all stuff that I've never really thought too much about. And now we are. This yeah, is I know. It's exciting, isn't um, it? <laughs> no, but, um, but. I dealt with it, but I was also always like a class clown. I used to make people laugh a lot and, mm -hmm. and get along with almost anybody. So um, so how did you get into trouble with the law? Like, was it, was it because of the gang stuff that you wanted to... How, how did that all transpire? So... Whenever I tell people about my addictions, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, it all stemmed way before I ever even knew what drugs were with mm -hmm. lying and stealing. But I feel like there's a core addiction that even leads with those two, and I still have that, and that's adrenaline. I'm addicted mm -hmm. to adrenaline. Yeah. I'm uh. addicted to a, a fast heartbeat, whether it's lying and trying to get away with it, stealing, trying to get away with it. 
um, doing as many drugs as I can trying to get away with it. There was only that one time that I popped a bunch of drugs not trying to be there. Right. Most of the times I just was trying to test my limits, but I wanted to live. Um, I was the person that did mass amount of drugs around everybody around me that would beg me to stop doing that because they're so high off right. the little bit amount. But I'm just like, I'm good. Like I, I felt like I knew my tolerance. And I mean, at, at this point, I have overdosed a few times. Um, I have lost my heartbeat. But uh, I was never Narcan. It was weird. It was just I came back to life. Um, you know, I was at a party and it was one of my buddies that was there with me. And just totally lost my heartbeat in the living room of this party. All these people are there and people are trying to like say, hey, we need to call 911, this, that. And the other my buddy's like, nah, he's going to be all right. And I just came back. That That's extraordinary. It was, um I just, I don't know how to explain it. I've had just some extreme favor in my life yep. by God. And uh, yep. just. That's how I feel about all of my addiction. And I had a friend who he passed a couple of years ago, actually, the beginning of kind of COVID, but he had somewhere around 40 something years clean and sober, uh, stopped using and drinking when he was 21. So that tells you how young he was when he started. And he would tell me all the time, you know, I don't even deserve the time I have now. So I'm just going to make the best of it. And Candace and I talk about this sometimes. I've talked about this a lot that, um, and it's not in a like, it's not in a self-sacrificing way, but I feel like my life is very utilitarian. Like it needs, it needs to serve a purpose greater than mine because I I don't even deserve the life I have now because I, I, I shouldn't be here from all the that I did. I'm sorry, we're not supposed to cuff. From all the <laughs> stuff I did. Um, and so, and it's not like, I don't feel bad about it and I don't feel like um, a martyr, but I feel like there's no, again, there's there's no bad days. I just, breathing is a good day. There, I mean, certainly there are days that have been rough. And um, Candace and I were talking about this too. I've, I've been going through a lot myself the last six or seven months, mental health wise, and I don't normally have depression or any of that stuff. Um, you know, a lot of my family and close friends deal with that and I've just never have. Um, and so this has been really hard for me the last six or seven months. But I still feel like, well, as long as I wake up in the morning, you know, there's still purpose. There's still stuff for me to do. Um, and that's kind of, I also was thinking about what you said about the addiction. Um, you know, I don't know if you ever went to 12 step. I did for a while and I really appreciate what they have to offer people. I do. Like, I probably wouldn't have been clean if it wasn't for 12 step, but I don't really go so much anymore. But one of the things, you know, that we hear in, in 12 step is that it's not the drugs. It's the drugs is just one part of addiction. And it really is like it's the high off of getting away with something. It's the high off like mm -hmm. it, it. That's why, you know, with my kid, I have four kids and with them try to, you know, not let them get into. It's almost like trying to stay ahead of them and trying to keep them positive so they're not like feeling like they get away with something because then it feeds into that addiction mentality. And mm -hmm. my husband and I both have some pretty strong addiction mentality. So, you know, I don't I don't know if there's a statistic, but I feel like if there is, you know, out of four kids, I'm always worried that at least one of them, you know, is going to head down that road and hopefully not harder than we went. So I it's the it's all the other pieces of addiction because quitting using drugs is just one piece yeah. of the mental health you know, journey that is addiction. Exactly. exactly. I mean, the, it, there's there's so many other components, you know. It's, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, you obviously have to deal with the addiction, but the addiction doesn't stand by itself, you know. There's... Yeah. And it just helps cloud stuff. Pretty much. And, and even back to, like, when I first started getting in trouble and stuff, it was at a very young age. Um, so some of the first trouble I ever got in. Now, this didn't necessarily go against me criminally, and I was so young, but it easily could have. Um, my parents ran an Atlantic self-storage over on the East Coast in Florida, um, which is a storage facility that has an apartment above the stairs, so that's where we lived for like six years. Um, and of course, there's a bunch of people that were like overseas or out of state that just store their stuff and can't be there all the time um, to come in and pay every month. So there was this book. It was like an automatic credit card thing. So mom could run the people's thing on their monthly thing. Well, at one point I had found out about this book and I had taken tons and tons of credit card numbers and I was buying 
all this stuff online. Next thing you know, I had a porn addiction. Um, I was buying all these porn websites and I was going to church and handing like the passwords out to all my friends. Um, it wow. was yeah. at church. <laughs> yeah. And where I got in trouble is I had access to all of these credit card numbers and then I went and used my mom's. So my mom's like having to call these people saying, hey, your cards you declined, your cards declined. Cause I'm spending thousands and thousands oh, wow. of dollars at like 12 years old. Dear. Um, just online video games and stuff. There was one video game I bought myself to number one in the world with over like 10 million people within a matter of like two days. Um, and it was it any was 12 crazy. year old's dream. <laughs> it was it was crazy. Like It was called Mafia Boss. It wasn't even for a 12 year old to play. Um, it was something that one of my mom's um, co-workers who would like come in and watch The Office every once in a while if she needed to go out there called a floater. He would come in. That was a game he played. So, you know, I wanted to play it. Next thing you know, I found my way to bring myself to the top. Um, and Amazing. that was a that was a rush. That was, you know, yeah. part of the adrenaline. Oh, so there was course. so much to that. And when I, I think if I'm not mistaken. It was one day I came home from school and uh, my mom like had went through my room and found all these little oh, pieces no. of paper with people's credit card numbers and everything. So there was a couple of these people like I had to tell face to face at a really young age, like, ouch. Like I took your credit card number and I bought porn or I bought this or I bought that. Like and some people I had to help clean out their storage units. Um, you know, that was kind of my punishment for that. And uh although lucky, really, because it could have been much worse than that. And it could have been. I was so young and like it it's just so weird that it it, it went against people's bank accounts, I think, in, in some extent, um, you know, or whatever. But it was uh just it was crazy. So all that stuff, like I had so many different addictions before I ever knew what drugs were, and mm-hmm. you know, all that on top of what happened when I was younger, there could have been a few different things that led to me actually trying to pull that trigger when, uh, you know, my yeah, freshman year. I was going to ask you about, like, just thinking about me when I was 12, because we do, we have a lot in common, a lot now, I'm realizing. But um, other than I, I really didn't want to be out there in the gangs, or I didn't want to be out there in any of that. But, um, but I did want to be accepted. But I also was like, super, like, you know, there was a few times because I was the youngest of five. So there's a few times my parents just kind of gave up because they, they'd been through so much trouble with all my older siblings that when it came to me, they were just like, whatever you want to do. And I was someone, if they had said, no, you're not going to do that, I would have stopped because I was so afraid of my parents. And I was so afraid of like people thinking bad things of me. And so I'm just imagining like 12 year old me doing something wrong and then getting caught for all that. Like that would have affected my mental health. Oh, yeah. And I'm curious if that. Well, it probably did, but what did you, I mean, how did that affect your self-esteem when that happened? Was it a relief that they found out or was it harder? So it's funny. My mom always had a saying. She said, son, your sins will always find you out. Yeah. <laughs> it seems <laughs> like almost every yeah. single time she was 100%. That's why I try not yeah. to do anything wrong. I don't want to face it. it. Right. Um, you know what? This was, this was my problem. Um, I would have always gotten in trouble for all the wrong that I did. I was scared of my parents too. Um, yeah. Don't really know why, but I was. Um, I lied about everything. Yeah. Um, and the lying made everything worse. My mom, my just every time I would get trouble, my mom would be like, "You make it so much harder on yourself every time you lie." I've had my mouth washed out with soap numerous <laughs> times, like just straight yeah, dial, yeah. <laughs> like poured in my mouth. Like, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> right? But it would never stop me. None of that stuff ever stopped me because it was like an adrenaline rush. I don't know. I yeah. guess maybe, yeah. I, maybe I liked the pain too. I yeah. don't know. I, I, I didn't really used to cut myself, but I used to inflict pain on myself. I don't, yeah. I don't know why I used to do crazy stuff. I used to put cigarettes and stuff out on my arm. Um, and legs and stuff like I have a matching cigar that I have relit a burn on, on this arm and my foot. <laughs> like, yeah. it, I was just, I don't know why. definitely self-harm. You don't have to don't cut yourself I, I to be self-harming. To, yeah. I used to let people like take Twizzlers and stuff and smack my arm as hard as they could. I don't know. Wow. I was like, I was like a, like a low level Steve-O. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> I was like a Stevo with some extra morals, <laughs> <laughs> kind of. It's thing. almost counterintuitive, but I get what you mean. <laughs> yeah. But that- um, you know, I just there was something about it that I just didn't care. Right. I did not care. Um, I got kicked out of church camp. So um, when you were fourteen, I could 
you can go work at this church camp. And it was a church camp that I used to go to a lot of summers. So I finally went and I worked there and I ended up getting kicked out of church camp for stealing a bunch of people's money. Um, and we only made like 40 cent an hour. And so like people aren't making much there and why people are at work, I'm going in these trailers and uh, taking people's money right out of their wallets and stuff like that. Um, Ended up getting kicked out of church camp. While I was at church camp, July 4th, 2007, I had a four-wheeler land on top. I was on the front luggage racks. We hit a jump. I fell off, and the four-wheeler landed on top of me. Um, there was like a two-year period where the four-wheeler landed on top of me. I got hit by the car, and I got dragged by a car. Um, it was it was wow. crazy. And, uh, yeah, and you're walking all over the country, and I'm barely walking across town. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? I've only broken two bones in my life, and that was like before I was eight years old. Really? I broke my nose when I was seven, and my collarbone when I was. You didn't break three. anything when that car hit you? Nope. I got a little bit of road rash. I walked away. The lady wanted to take me to the hospital, and I refused to go. We, she was like, "Well, you have to at least let me call nine one one and let somebody come check on you." Which was the hour and a half later that the public <laughs> service aid came. They just send a uh, a cop, an ambulance, a fire truck, nothing. I could have been like almost dead. I could have had That's internal injuries, crazy. but I was jaywalking. So there was nothing I could do about it. That's crazy. <laughs> wow. I was telling him nobody really uses the crosswalks here. We did to get over here, but jaywalking is just a way of life around here. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. We which, which, jaywalk. In yeah. these cities, I don't mind. I get. Yeah. Well, Cause there's, yeah. Yeah. Probably well, not. Well, I mean, I, I cross busy highways now, but I'm, I'm extremely cautious. That was just a crazy, like I looked both ways when that car just came out of nowhere. I think it that's was, how it happens. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think yep. it was like a Bermuda triangle thing where it was <laughs> a space warp and then boom. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, so what, it, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that everything got progressively worse I mean, I, I read some stuff that, that you did end up in jail and then you ended up going to prison, I think. So how how did that all happen? Um, so like I said, I started getting in trouble when I was younger. Um, you know, I've talked to the cops for one time we were living in an apartment complex. I went to my neighbor's house and took a laptop out a couple of days later. One of my neighbors like, hey, you need that who knew about it? I was like, hey, you need to take that laptop back up to that dude. He's like, uh, he's about to get a private investigator. Wow. So like, I went up and gave him the laptop. I was like, my bad for stealing it. We talked for a few minutes. Um, a cop ended up coming and was like, well, thank you for giving the laptop back. Like, you don't need to be doing that. Um, and and that was when I was fourteen or fifteen. Um, and then boom, started getting in trouble with. Well. I tried to join the gang or whatever, and it wasn't even a gang-related thing where I first started getting, where I first got in trouble. It was two guys that I was in high school with. Um, I was in summer school at the time, and one of those guys was there, and he asked me to give him a ride somewhere after school one day. So I asked my mom, I was like, hey, can we drive out here? She's like, no, you can't take my ro my car on any dirt roads. I was like, well, can we go hang out over here? She was like, yeah, it's close to the house. As long as you don't, do not go out to Middleburg or whatever. I was like, okay. Boom, drove straight out the middle bird. Definitely won't do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, we ended up, we picked up his buddy. So they had uh, like, Lint gave a drug dealer some money who was supposed to bring him something. And the dude ended up leaving him hanging. I guess the dude was at work, but he they thought he was there because he had left his cell phone home. They were calling. The windows were open. They could hear it ringing. But so they're sitting there banging on the doors and windows. I never got out the car, and uh, the neighbors ended up calling the cops because they were banging on the windows. They came in the car. We smoked a bowl. The cops showed up, and uh, I got arrested for a brand-new bong stem that I've been smoked out of twice, and uh, I ended up catching like eight months in a teen court program where I got drug tested every week. Wow. Um, All that other stuff, and you get caught for a brand-new bong stem. <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. Um, That's how it goes. Oh, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, it was so wild. So um, ended up getting drug tested every week, and that was around the same time that the K2 and the synthetic stuff started coming out. The first stuff I ever really touched, it was called Mr. Nice Guy, um, and it was very powerful. Like, I had heard that it had killed people, but my cousin was like, hey, there's this stuff that came out. I was like, bro, I can't smoke. I'll get drug tested. He's like, nah, you can pass drug test on this. And I was like, oh, okay. So I started smoking it and got hooked. It was just straight chemicals that went to my brain. So yeah. like I ended up getting a bunch of people hooked. I was like, man, y'all got to try this. Y'all got to try this. I ended up having some friends that would make the stuff. Like I used to go over and smoke at these certain friends' house that lived way out off this dirt road. And I brought this stuff over 
And they used to make Rubik's cubes and all the weirdest stuff and like sell this stuff online. They made like thousand dollar Rubik's cubes and stuff they would sell online. Right. Um, but they they learned how to make the synthetic stuff and would start making it. So at any given time, I could get as much as I want for free. At one point, um, I tried to join the Marine Corps. I was in the delayed entry program with uh, for eight months. I lived with my recruiter for two months. After I got kicked out of my house, I ended up taking this gun over to their house and taking every bit of the K2 that they had made. Um, I was just, just I didn't, wow. I had that bad of an addiction that I didn't care yeah. if it was my friends. At that point, I had never really stole from friends like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe once or twice. Not that it's a good thing. It's not a good thing at all. But um, that was, I'd steal from my family before I would steal from my friends kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But at that point, I had all this K2 sitting there. Um, and this was, this was right after I had graduated while I was in the delayed entry program. My mom had came to pick me up to take me to the grocery store one day. I had fell asleep, left all my stuff out on the back porch because my recruiter's gone all day, every day. Right. Um, and just let me stay at his house. So she came and she was like, oh no, this is like why you got kicked out and came over here. She was like, you're not about to do this to your, your recruiter. Like she poured thousands of dollars of this stuff down the toilet and flushed it. Um, and I'm so mad. I'm trying to hide some of the other canisters to take back to the house. I'm not going to let her get it all, um, kind of thing. And, uh, ended up, it was like a month later, a couple weeks later. Um, I ended up just causing some problems. I stole my dad's credit card, which I had done a few times. And I would go to like Walmart, get a pack of gum and take out a hundred dollars at every open register that I could. Um, and there'd been a couple times that I had got home and there was like a, a duffel bag with my stuff in the driveway. Like, you know, you can't yeah. come back to the house kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I completely deserved every bit of it. Um, I'm like, shoot, I've had that and I didn't even do any of that stuff. <laughs> I'm telling you, right. Oh, man. I our was... poor parents, right? Yeah. I, think, I think about what we put our parents well, through. It, it's weird. I used to have this, I used to have this sick justification that my parents will always have unconditional yep. love for me. Yeah. That no matter what I do, like they'll always love me even if they don't like me kind of thing. Yep. Um, But at the same time, I was right. I had that. But I've met so many people being locked up that have never even done one thing wrong to their parents and didn't even get in that much trouble. But because they got locked up, their parents will never talk to them again. Yeah. Um. I've wow. I've seen it happen so many times where families will completely disown whether be, even if it was driving because they got a DWI for smoking weed. Right. Um. You know, parents will disown their their kids, and it's so sad. I was so blessed with the family that I grew up in. That's why, like at the beginning, when I said I'm sorry to anybody that hasn't got to experience that, I really mean that mm-hmm. because I am very thankful for the life that I got. My family did not deserve for me to put them through all the stuff that I did. Um. There was no reason for me to put them through the stuff that I did, other than the fact that I loved adrenaline and I still do. I just chase it in healthier ways. Um. But uh. It was um, try to take my mom's laptop one time. Um, that's a whole crazy story, but I'm not going to get into it because that's a long story. <laughs> um, but that was my first time ever actually going to county jail as an adult. Um, I did like 36 days. After like 30 days, my mom came in and visited me, and then she tried to drop the charges, but the state wouldn't. But they dropped it from a felony to a misdemeanor, so they released me on my own recognizance right there. It was like two weeks later, I got arrested in another county while I'm waiting to go to court there for taking my mom's coworker's credit card and buying a Dr. Pepper at Sonic. And I caught another month in the county for buying a Dr. Pepper at Sonic with somebody's (laughs) credit card. Um, It's a whole different ballgame when you're an adult. Gosh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. All that money. I never even thought yeah. about that. All that money I had spent with those credit cards and just kind of got, yeah, you, you know, a old, little yeah. slap on the wrist. Yeah. You probably and then I, boom, here. I go spend two dollars and 14 cents at a Sonic yep. each yeah. month. Yeah. That's so wild to think about. Never. Yeah. Thank you for breaking that perspective <laughs> up. Actually. It's probably something I should have thought about a long time ago. Yeah, you know, you know, what's funny is like, so I, I've got four kids. They're ages 11 to eight is going to be 17 here soon. And um, three younger ones are, are boys, and man, they really like put me through it sometimes. But we talk a lot about why I have, because I I'm pretty strict as a parent. Uh, I'm about as strict as probably stricter than my parents were. Um, but I also try to like get ahead of them. I try to be honest with them about life and and everything. When they ask me questions, I feel they're old enough to know the answers. But we talk to them a lot about, you know, there was oh, so in my house, unless you're 18, you don't own an electronic. 
I don't care if you bought it with your own money. You don't own that. I should be able to come in at any point. And the reason why, and I know this is super controversial for all parents, but there, I told the kids, there are some things you can do as a kid that I am legally responsible for and I could go to jail for. There are c- crimes you can commit that I would go to jail for. And so until that day ends and you're legally responsible for everything you do, I have to have some kind of fail safe. I have to be able to at least check in, you know, because it's my it's my butt on the line. And so and that's true. Like, I, you know, as kids, I don't think we think about like how much our parents are on the hook for, especially nowadays. Like, you know, when I was a kid growing up, there was probably a lot less stringent laws, you know, for parents um, and kids just kind of got a slap on the wrist, too. But now, like, yeah, you, you could go to jail for something your kid does, especially if it's like porn and stuff like that. Yeah, you can go to jail for that. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty strict with the kids. And uh, for the most part, I think they're all right with that. But I also try to explain to them, you know, why. And I do try to stay ahead of stuff so that the temptation isn't there because I know that you can't take that back. You know, you can't take that that need for adrenaline you can't take that back once once kids and adults um start heading down that road it's it's pretty difficult to come back from so yep. uh, that's interesting yeah yep yeah so Absolutely. so I, i'm assuming that the the tale gets worse in, <laughs> in terms of the the amount of trouble that you get in and and more than just a card for a soda yeah right yeah so so I won't um I'm not gonna get into every different instance mm-hmm. and, and no, stuff no. like that but I will go ahead and say that um I have been in county jail eleven times prison twice mm-hmm. um the two prison sentences one was for eighteen months and one was uh, sixty months which of course with gain time I didn't do the full amount I did fifty one months off the sixty I did a little over twelve months off the eighteen um, how can I ask you how that was, like, as an experience? Did did that change you? What, what ha- you know, what was your... Yeah, if we send people to jail for rehabilitation, I think most of us know that's not the case. Right. No, um, it's easier to get drugs and stuff in, yeah. in prison and stuff than it is on the streets because instead of, like, okay, who can I call? What plug has what? It's, like, what bunk do I got to walk to in the dorm today to yeah. get this Wow. Um, kind of thing? And, you know, you're secluded. Like, people, like, I have people that have, um, you know, lashed out at me for volunteering at a homeless shelter before um, because of stuff that's going on in a homeless shelter, but in reality, every homeless shelter across America, every correctional institution across America, every facility across America that you're not supposed to have certain things in, people are still going to bring those things in there. Because the one place Mm -hmm. that you go for having this stuff where you're not supposed to is the one place that's the easiest to get it in prison. We, I run a winter shelter every, this is my third year running it. It's uh, October to the end of March. And we, it can't be low barrier. It can't be no barrier for sure. And it, it can't really be low barrier because, you know, with, first of all, this community is pretty rough and we don't want to burn our bridges, but also we want to respect the places that we're in because we don't own them. But um, we don't check people's stuff and we tell them like, you know, we don't expect you to stop using here. We, we expect that you don't use in the, in the building. We expect that you, you know, you, we can't have visitors here because it's just that kind of a place. But um, we know people use and we know that they're not going to quit just to have a shelter over their head. So we're just going to. But we also believe that people should have shelter regardless of whether they're using or not, because it always makes things better. But um, we also have non-congregate shelter because I've been in shelters before in congregate shelters. And it's just there's no privacy. There's no respect. Like there's no it's just it's just rough. And like there's no dignity in it. And so. I hope in the future we get a, a homeless shelter here that's year round um, that is non congregate so people can have their own privacy and their own space. And we can't tell people, you know, you can't be high here or you can't be drunk here. We can just, we just say, like, you just have to be respectful enough where you're not, you know, upsetting your neighbors and you're not being abusive to people. But I know I've been in, around a lot of shelters. I've volunteered at a lot of shelters and uh, there's some things that run rampant in shelters and you, I don't know how you prevent that. It's pretty, we just don't have a system that allows for that, it feels like. There's not enough crowd control in those shelters and any facilities across America that's going to keep any of that stuff out regardless. You know, um, 
it's not meaning that you condone it or you're okay with it right. or you're enabling it. You just cannot keep that stuff out. People literally put stuff in their rectum to hide it. You yeah. know, not everybody's yeah. going to go in everybody's rectum. You yeah. know, no, we I mean? don't. We don't even search not. their bag. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> type thing. No, it's absolutely true, and it. And I think you have to meet people where they are. So, you know, if somebody is in the midst of an addiction, you you. You telling them that they need to stop is not going to make them stop. That's just not, you know, they're not they're not there. And when they are, they'll stop. And the second you take away any any uh, resources or support that cares about them in any type of way, your crime is going to skyrocket in the yeah. communities that those people are living in. Um, and that's just is what it is going to go from whatever's happening at those shelters that people don't like is going to go right to their front yards. Um, yep. And that's just what it is, unfortunately. And everybody thinks that, you know, just because they're living in a tent that they are a criminal or an addict. I've met so many people on the road that were like, yeah, I slept in my tent for a while while I was building my house. Mm -hmm. You know, I was homeless mm -hmm. because I had to move over here, slept in a tent for a few months, went and got a job, and now I own a place. Yep. Um, You know, there's so many different type of situations. Um, Not every person's using because I've been to a lot of um, you know, different meetings and stuff that I've spoke at that have, you know, the unhoused community come in there because they're clean. Um, not every person's doing that. You know what I'm saying? Yep, it's, exactly. Uh, so um, it's like it's like deciding that if somebody is looks a certain way or or is sleeping rough or whatever, that they must be, you know, a drug user and they must be criminal and that, you know, n no. No, no, we're definitely each not. of definitely us. Not. We, we're we get each so of us many, individuals. We had over 500 people walk in our door last year, and we provided almost 4,000 walk in services. And the majority of those people that come in are elderly and disabled. And, yep. and it doesn't mean that there aren't people out there that have criminality or that have substance use. Sure. But I, I think also we're not having a conversation about how we actually could prevent that. We right. just want it to go away. Right, right. And it doesn't go away, it's in every community. So it's interesting. You know, prison was obviously not a rehabilitation tool for you. So at some point, something happened that you turned the corner. Um, well, real quick, I want to touch on something that's important to the journey. It was, um, I think, my second or third time in the county jail as an adult I was doing a year in the county jail and this was back in 2013 and that's where I came across the idea to walk across America um, I read a newspaper article titled America on foot about a guy named Harrison Melanian who had walked from Tallahassee Florida to California I fell in love with the story knew I wanted to walk across America um, tried to when I got out in 2014 I, I reached out to him he said man it was a life-changing experience for the better the only thing I would have done different was walk for a cause I tried to put together a walk for two totally different causes that were relevant and contradictory to my life um to take off January 1st 2015 um, ended up going to county jail again in that process <laughs> got put on probation so I was gonna have to push the walk back on January 1st, 2015, while I was still on probation, I ended up breaking into a post office and then going to prison for the first time. When I got out of prison, um, you know, I kind of forgot about the walk or whatever, went back to prison for five years um, after just, uh, well, this is, you know, kind of a big part of the story as well. And with restoration and, and family and relationships and stuff like that. So it was 2017, two days before Mother's Day. Um, me and some of my friends were doing acid and cocaine in my parents' garage. Um, we ended up leaving, coming back. They had locked us out. I was trying to get back in um, in the garage. Um, my dad, who's disabled, came out and was trying to have me, um, you know, leave for the night and tell them to go, and I wasn't having it. My mom tried to tell me to leave. I wasn't having it. Ended up getting in a big argument where my dad ended up swinging a guitar at me, and it totally missed me, and it hit my mom in the face. And her nose wow. started bleeding. So when that happened, I, I put hands on my dad and it, it led to um, CPR. And, um, you know, I had to give him, you know, chest compressions and all that. Um, he, everything, he, he caught his breath back. Um, and then the cops showed up like just a couple minutes later. My mom was on the phone with the cops while I was going down. Um, he came back. I went to jail on domestic. When I got bonded out a month later, 
I didn't have anywhere to go at that point. So my mom ran a whole different storage facility at this time. And it was a four story climatized building. We had a unit on the top floor. So I was sleeping in her unit. Um, but I was also breaking into other storage units while I was in there at my mom's work. Um, and at some point me and two other people kicked in a drug dealer's door. Um, thank God that drug dealer wasn't home or I would not be here right now. Yeah. Um, but we went and kicked in a drug dealer's door. Both of my co-defendants had a gun on camera. Um, so I caught an armed burglary then and a uh, bunch of grand thefts and whatever. So I ended up catching five years in prison. Um, my two and a half years into that prison sentence, something clicked in my head and said I didn't want to live like that anymore. My mom tried to get me sentenced to rehab after that five-year prison sentence that day in the courtroom. And my judge was like, you know what? I'm not going to sentence him to rehab. He's been there before. He was like, um, you know, he ha he's had all kinds of opportunities and resources offered to him. He's broken probation every single time he's been on it. He was like, uh, yeah, support system's good, um, but that man's not going to change unless he wants to change. And he did not sentence me to the rehab. That day I was happy, but for the wrong reasons. I was happy that I wasn't getting more time after prison. Two and a half years later, something clicked in my head, and I remember that I just I just didn't want to do it anymore. And after that, I remember that my judge told me that, and it just clicked in my head like, wow, he's right. Like, I have to want it. I really have to want it. Yeah. Um, you know, from years of just doing the, the drugs and the withdrawals and the sweating and running around, all that weight that I had gained and was depressed, I had a, you know, self-confidence, you know, I was skinny again and all this, that, and the other, um, you know, running with a whole group of people. I didn't care. Like if anybody tried me, like they had a problem and it, I was going to make it known kind of thing, you know? Um, but, uh, I was just tired of living like that and I had the change. So I gained that weight in prison. I didn't like it. And my nickname went, um, I went from Kindle to my nickname was Bad Bodied Kindle and people would call me BBK and I didn't like it. So um, I started working out with the most like elite workout crew on my compound. These guys would go so hard every day. I would watch people for over a year. People would ask, some of them would ask me to come join them, but I would watch people go out there almost every day and never go back out again um, because they were so intense. And one day I went out there with them and I, we ran like some miles or whatever. And I was so far behind everybody. It was so hard to keep up. I could barely do anything. Everybody, they were doing squats with people on their shoulders. I could barely do squats with nobody on my shoulder over there without my legs like seizing up. Um, but then boom, a couple months later, I had went from a 12 minute mile to like a, my fastest mile I ever did was a five minute and 57 second mile. I went from barely being able to do 10 push ups to a hundred burpees straight. And that's where like you jump down, toes, uh, hand on the ground, you kick your feet back, uh, or you squat, put your hands on the ground, kick your feet back, do it, and then you jump up, and then you go right back yeah, into I could do it. like and, five of those. <laughs> and I was, I was a monster. When I first started, I could, I could barely even do a burpee at all, let alone do a jump afterwards. Um, so I moved myself up so fast that within a few months, my nickname went from bad bodied Kendall to Roger from American Dad because my head was too big for my body. And uh, and it was really funny, but there was progress. And that progress boosted my mental health in a whole nother way. Every single time I completed an accomplishment, my mental health was boosted. I was like, I did that. I literally went 60. So I did one a part of my life change was writing goals. Um, I always, you know, people talk about writing goals or I need to set goals, this, that, and the other. I just thought taking a pen and paper and writing down stuff I need to do and I could just tell myself to do it was the dumbest <laughs> thing until I actually exactly. wrote down goals. <laughs> um, I wrote down a, a, a yeah. list of goals for 30 days and, and they were pretty intense. And I completed like 98% of the goals in that month and I felt so good about myself that I waited a month and then another month, I did a 60 day goal list and I did it in the three G's. It was God first and those were my spiritual goals. It was um, grow up, those are my mental goals and it was go hard and those are my physical goals. Hmm. Um, we had little mirrors in prison that on this piece of paper I wrote my goals on, I folded it over the paper and I would not look at myself for two months. That was one of the most self-disciplined, wow. hardest things ever because I wanted to see that progress that I was getting every day. Yeah but I made myself wait for two months to look at myself in the Sounds mirror. Sounds like the adrenaline 
shifted from breaking the law to uh, the progress. The progress. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Progress. There's so, an addiction to that, too, which is, I'm not going to say it's a bad addiction. It's no. Just, so it is. That's a good. Well, drive. you have to I'm, deal with what your biology is. Right. I mean, if well, if you've got an addiction to that adrenaline, let's have the adrenaline yeah, be exactly. for good stuff. Well, a lot of times when it comes to addiction, um, whenever you get rid of one addiction, normally there's something else that follows suit anyways. And most of the time it is a positive thing. So I'm a, I'm a recovery coach with a group called Addict to Athletes, a nonprofit organization oh, based awesome. out of Utah. I love that. Um, and uh, they, 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 they do bike bike races from like uh, Utah, Lake City, Utah to Las Vegas, like hundreds wow. of miles. They do all kinds of stuff, hikes and everything. Um, but they also remember people who have lost their lives to drug overdose suicide. Um, the people that run it, they are therapists and, and you know, licensed and registered, all that stuff. Can you be a part of that if you have asthma? <laughs> Just um, asking for a friend? <laughs> probably no, so, not. <laughs> so um, you probably can. Um, they, Just... they're, they, they, they welcome anybody. So they, uh, they're a non-anonymous program. They, they like the 12 steps, but they don't want anybody to feel not. They, they're all about yeah, yeah. sharing your stories yeah. and stuff like that. Um, which is just absolutely incredible. So um, actually today, a year ago, I was walking in Utah and I actually went to one of their meetings. I nice. um, met up with them. So um, I've done a podcast with them before. They uh, sponsored me to take their recovery coach class um, because I couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I have a recovery coach certificate. They also sponsored me with a laptop so I can write my book, which I've already been, I've been writing for a little bit now. I've still got a long way to go. But um, they literally hooked me up with the laptop. So uh, their one of their main mottos is called erase and replace. So it's taking that that unhealthy addiction yeah. and erasing it and replacing it with a healthier addiction. So my thing has always been adrenaline rush. But instead of kicking indoors or robbing people or or stealing or lying and trying to get away with it, now I get my adrenaline rush with cars coming at me at 60, 80 miles an hour. Every time a car hits that white line within 100 yards of me, my heart drops for a second, yeah. but the second it gets back on the road and past me, I'm like, yeah, I made it. And that was an accomplishment in itself. Every day that I say, hey, I got 14 miles to walk today, when I make it to the town, it's an accomplishment. Absolutely. Um, so every single day I'm boosting my mental health. So how long have you been out there walking? Um, I started with my feet in the, um, yeah, so you mentioned 457 days. Mm -hmm. I only count the days on the days that I walk. I've had a lot of complications on this journey, especially the first year. Um, but I took off January 1st, 2022 with my feet in the Atlantic Ocean. I did 13 states diagonal across um, to put my feet in the Pacific Ocean on uh, April 12th, 2023, which also doubled as my four-year drug-free date. Um, and then after that, I walked up to Cape Flattery, which is the most northwestern point of the connecting United States. After that, I realized I wanted to go to every point, every corner of the connecting United States. Now I'm heading down to San Diego, back to Florida, down to the Keys, and up the East Coast to Lubeck, Maine. Yeah, wow! A, I was we, were, we I talked a little bit with him about my aversion to travel. Yeah, like heavy, yeah. heavy aversion right. to travel. <laughs> I I can watch it through you. Then that yeah, that'll exactly. be exactly my, my my addiction switched from drugs and and all of that to pouring my life into giving back to my community, and so. Same adrenaline rush. I every time I get a grant for you know hundred thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, I feel really good about the work I'm doing. But I'm not a traveler, <laughs> and so this is. Sorry, will like Kindle do it for you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got you. Live vicariously through the journey. Yep. Um, there's you know what I have a lot of disabled people and and people that just physically can't do it that literally tell me that they live vicariously through this journey. Well, you've got a Facebook um site. I I went to it. It's um. It's called, help me out. A walking testimony. A walking And testimony. if you put underscores in between like A underscore walking underscore testimony, that's also my YouTube and my Instagram. Oh, but I on my Facebook, that. it's just A walking testimony without the uh, things. And here's a business card for you as well with my social on there. Thank yeah. you. Not my social security number. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> so you're... You're doing point to point then at this point in, I mean, you've been, you've done like 4,000 some miles, haven't you? I mean, it's, it's a lot. 4,247 miles, I believe. Wow. Wow. So you're heading south now, you're, you're in Oregon, you're going to San Diego and then across the south. 
southern states back yep. in Florida. Uh, during yep. the summer, too. Yeah. You might be yeah. a little toasty. Yeah. Yeah. We'll manage. We'll be okay. <laughs> as long as I'm like through Arizona before the dead of the summer, yeah, I yeah. think I'll be yeah. okay. I could deal with some Texas heat and stuff. I just don't want to be in like near Death Valley or nothing like can, that. Can right. I ask you, so, um, I mean, I was homeless for nine years off and on. And um, I know you're not homeless, but in, in the same respect, you're out there a lot of times in the elements. And it is one of my biggest fears to be homeless again, I, especially in, in it's been 11 years almost and things have changed drastically. Um have I mean some of my worst moments were sleeping out in the middle of the mud and the rain and just like feeling like nobody cared and so I know a lot of people care and a lot of people follow you but do you have moments where you're actually sleeping outside where it's rough or do you feel I mean do you how do you feel about that um so for me I choose to be out here yeah I don't have to be um and it makes me love every bit of it, even the challenging stuff. Um, at one point, I've had I've had three tents that had broken zippers um, before. At one point, like some nights, I had to put like a hundred pieces of duct tape just to take yeah. my tent shut. Um, I've uh, one time my tent was broken. This was right after I had my cart stolen. One time, it was in the back of somebody's truck. I had to bear mace somebody twice in a hotel room. They end up stealing this truck driving it like an hour and a half back to Arkansas from Oklahoma, got it stuck in the woods and all that. They broke every spoke on one of my rims. So when I got the cart back, it, you know, it went just like a couple miles and the whole tire folded under the oh, cart. No. Um, and I got stuck at a state park sleeping in a hammock with a tarp over it because my tent was broke yeah. um, for a week. I had to sleep in a hammock for a week. It's not the most comfortable thing when you got to do it yeah, for a yeah. week straight. But um, there was major thunderstorms and lightning and all kinds of crazy stuff. But for me, there was like a sense of excitement because I'm on an adventure. Yeah. You know, I feel like like Frodo from Lord of the Rings. Yes. Like, you know, like yeah. there was definitely a lot more complications for them. But like it's an adventure, a grand adventure. Yeah. And like I feel like I should have brought a ring across America with me. I feel something. like Sam, I just want to be back <laughs> in the Shire. <laughs> Like that's that's why I don't travel too. Is like so I get guys, so much I hate anxiety. to tell you this. Yeah, we are, I know. We are completely out of time already. There I were so many things I wanted. I, to ask. I know, and I knew as soon as you said what some of the things you weren't talk, wanted to talk about that we'd be we could be I know. Here for hours. Even when we have a light agenda, we end up I running. Can I just say like one last thing? Absolutely, um, please, guys. Do. Coach Kendall Ray, aka a Walking Testimony. I just want to let you know that you matter, and we do recover. Um, never forget that you are valued. You have purpose. You are loved and cared about. And um, when you want to change your life, if you really got the drive, you can do it. So God bless all of y'all, and thank y'all. Oh, thank Kendall, you. you're you're really an inspiration, and thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you know, if you want to find out more, please go to his Facebook page, and that is again, say it one more time. A walking testimony. And it's it's great. I I went and and looked at some of his stuff last night, and it was just like it's it's inspiring. So. Thank, Thank you, you, and good luck to you. Stay safe. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And Diana, thanks for reining him in and bringing him. <laughs> I mean, seriously, he's great. Well, I figured it was we were due. I haven't brought anybody in. <laughs> no, he's he's absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so both. much, Candace. And thank you. Yeah. Diana. And I want to thank our listening audience for tuning in. We've been chatting with Kindle, a walking testimony today. You can listen to the podcast on our website, kciw.org, under Our Community. KCIW is your community radio station. Please support our efforts by becoming a sustaining sponsor or a volunteer. It takes a village. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. 